Okay, we're going to speak about Helm as um, as Archie already uh, noted. So yeah, I started this week uh, in uh, in Quebec, and the um, day before I checked the weather. This is what I saw, and I'm like, well, um, it's Canada, right? That sounds about right. I'm ready, so I took my jacket. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been great. The, really loved it to be here this week. So thank you very much for for having me. Uh, by the way, this is like at home, and uh, you all can join me there because we are hiring technical people, um, t uh, technology evangelists, developer advocates, um, and um, it's it's nice. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Baruch, I'm Developer Advocate with JFrog. Um, this describes perfectly what I'm doing. Um, I don't know, I didn't see any beers today, so I'm kind of, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out afterwards, right? Is there any place here? Okay, we'll find some. Okay, uh, I'm at Baruch on Twitter. Um, you definitely should follow me about now, as you noticed, I'm a very entertaining guy. A lot of good wisdom on my Twitter account. Um, I prepared a special page for you called the show notes. Um, it's at jeffrocom slash show notes. Um, the slides are already there. Um, I'm trying to record this video for the first time this week. I hope this time it will work and tomorrow you will get the video of my talk and also uh, Cynthia's talk. My talk will be there. Cynthia's talk will be probably in the meetup page or something. We'll figure something out. Um, all the links of whatever I'm going to mention are already there. And the ratings, comments, we can chat about the talk there and a little raffle to thank you for being here. Um, that's the only link you need to remember or take a picture of. All the rest is there and you have it on every page in case you forget. Okay, so uh, we'll start with, uh, with Helm. It will be like two parts of today's talk. One will be introduction to Helm and, and the other will be more of um, proper dependency management in a broader sense uh, when we talk about continuous integration delivery pipelines. Who are familiar with Helm or heard about Helm or... Oh, okay, good. But definitely the majority of you. So we'll see how, how much I will be able to um, enlighten you or, or say something new that you didn't know. Um, well, first question, what dependency managers and printers have in common? Ah, now you don't know. Gotcha. Well, they both send to us from hell to make us to make our lives miserable. Um, if you didn't read this great comic of oatmeal about printers, you should go and do it. Not now, but it's awesome. The links are in the show notes. Well, dependency managers are very much alike. There is a great piece on Medium by Sam Boyer, who actually works on dependency management for the Go programming language, and. Um, so you want to write a package manager, you woke up, uh, up this morning, roll out of bed and thought, you know what? I don't have enough misery and suffering in my life. I know what to do. I'll write a language package manager. And then he goes to like, it seems purely technical problem and not very complicated. And then you try to do it. And then you discover software is terrible. People are terrible. There are too many different scenarios. Nothing will really work uh, for sure. It's provable that nothing really works for sure. And our lives are meaningless perturbations in swirling waters of house and um, entropy. And that's, that's true for basically any, any, any package manager. Um, anyone knows a package manager that they like? Yes, sir. You like NPM. Huh, that's interesting. Well, I'll tell you a story about NPM. It will take two minutes. And I promise you, you will dislike it the next the next second, okay? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. They are really, really, really terrible. And they are, well, okay -ish except of those terrible things. Right? So, yeah, no, NPM is, is, is horrible, but not the worst of them. Let's put it that way. Um, well, all of, by the way, Helm, you might like because it's not bad at all because it's very, very simple. They try to minimize the way they can fuck up by doing very, very little, which is a good way to do that. By the way, did you see the latest talking about minimizing the ways to fuck up by doing very little? 
the latest GitHub repo of Kelsey uh, Hightower. No code. The only way to write a perfectly secure application is not writing any code. This is uh, how many pull requests he has without without any code, like thousands. This is, by the way, true for develop for dependency managers as well. And this is, by the way, why Go still doesn't have an official dependency manager. Because they are so scared to write something horrible, they prefer not to do it at all. But, okay, uh, we're, that's, that's all fine. I have a whole talk about the horrible dependency managers. Um, Helm is better than the rest, and there are downsides that the community tries to help. And we, JFrog, uh, are one of the organizations who try to help. And there is a Helm sign going on um, on February 21st, 22nd. That's next week, I guess, um, or two weeks from now, in uh, Portland, Oregon. And um, our very own uh, Ankush is going to deliver a talk there about some issues with Helm that are fixable and how to fix it, what will be a good idea to fix it. It's called more charts, more problems, obviously, because it's a dependency manager. So we work on uh, fixing some scalability issues with Helm. We work on fixing some security issues with Helm. So basically, we are using our experience in JFrog in more than 10 years of trying to manage binary files to, um, to contribute to help. And this is why I am here today. Let's talk about Helm. So how to deploy anything to Kubernetes? Um, you go online and you copy a YAML file. It will probably be from documentation, but chances are from GitHub or from Stack Overflow. And then you paste it in your um, editor of choice, and then you fix intents and, and, and then you basically, you repeat. And, and you repeat it a lot because um, service descriptors, deployments, etc., cetera, um, they are usually, they're, they're done per servers, per, per service, sorry. So uh, here I have uh, um, my services uh, deployed. I deployed a couple of things here. So you can see Artifactory, Jenkins, and X-Ray. None of them, almost none of them, is a single is a single service, right? Those are microservices. So for example, for X-ray, you need one, two, three, four, five, six. Six different services. Um, and what the instructions before Helm said when you go to install X-ray? Well, copy those six YAML files, fix intents, and, uh, and you're good. So um, this, is, this is our lives before Helm, and that didn't work. Uh, how about, or did it? Oh, it did. Okay. So, um, and, and there is another issue. So this issue is clear. Another issue is that when we define a resource, when we define a service, we actually have to name an image by its tag. Right? So we have this thing here uh, that goes image, docker art factory, the docker app, 1.0. And that's a tag, that's a version. And then next thing, what we want to do is we want to build a new one. So we run docker build. And we, of course, bump up the version because that's a new, um, new version of our product. So now we have 1.1. One, one. And the next thing, what do we do? We do something like, OK, now we need to change the version file inside the YAML file. Right? Anyone did that? OK, couple of hands. What are the rest of you doing? Th this is horrible, right? This is, you don't want that. So wh what are the other options? Manual, that's always a good option, especially in our like times of continuous and automation pipelines. Manual work, that's what we strive for. Thank you very much. You sit here, I didn't, I didn't pay this gentleman. But latest sounds like a great idea, right? What can go wrong with latest? You will get back this um, a container uh, two months from now. Something went wrong with it. And what it is, well, we have no idea. It's latest, which means it can be anything. <laughs> right, so latest is a great, great invention. It's usually not the latest, except of one point of time when it is actually the latest. The rest of the time, it's not latest. But we don't know what it is. Right, so, so Helm actually solved those problems and a and, um, couple of more. So let's see about how we tackle that. So first of all, 
Helm encapsulates packages of Kubernetes deployments into discrete units. Right, so what, we, what I mentioned earlier, all those X-ray services now become this. This is a Helm chart that can have one or more Kubernetes services, and they are referred by name. I want to install X-ray, boom, whatever it takes to install X-ray will be installed. It also solves the problem of those descriptor files with powerful templating. So you can see here that instead of using 1.0 or 1.1, we actually use this template, and then we can change it, we can change this pattern with real values. And real values can come from uh, descriptor files, and that's another YAML file, because why not? Right, so we can put here stuff which changes rarely, for example, repository and full policy and this kind of stuff, and then we can pass the other values to our, um, to our template, which we actually want to change dynamically, such as uh, the tag name or the version, we can pass it in uh, um, environment variables or as command line parameters or in any other way we like. So this, this problem solved as well. Now, as I mentioned, Helm is very simple. This is what you see here is actually a um, Helm chart. You can see here it's called Dockerlab chart. It has a version. And then it's a, it's a targz. It's an archive. And inside this archive, all we have is a bunch of templates, different templates like deployment YAML and secret YAML and service YAML and all those. We have the chart YAML itself, which describes that's the metadata about the chart. We have the readme, readable text about what it is. And then we have the values YAML, which was what I showed you, uh, what I showed you previously, the values that will populate those templates that are in the templates directory. Very simple stuff. There is one more file, which is called the index YAML, and that's the index of my chart repository, of my Helm repository. It actually contains the list of all the charts available in this repository. Make sense so far? Very simple. And that's, that's a great advantage. Now, obviously, you can use templates, so you can reuse charts for multiple image versions, right? That's the idea. And you actually bump up the version of the chart when the descriptors files, the templates, or the, the, the values change but not every time you need to deploy a new version of a certain container image, right? Uh, so basically, let's say, for example, we have Artifactory 5.6.8 um, now, and the chart file for Artifactory is, the chart of, of Artifactory is the version of, of 1.404 or something. Anyway, this is not one-to-one -one relationship, and that's a good thing. Now, I mentioned how simple it is. Now, we're going to talk about the complicated part of, um, of Helm, and that's the tiller. Who knows what the word tiller means in English? It steers the boat. It's this fin in the, in the backside of the boat that actually does the, the, the steering, and it's controlled by Helm, which is kind of nice, but I think they got, we're getting carried a little bit too far with all this navy stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, so Tiller actually steers Kubernetes. You, it is installed inside a Kubernetes cluster, and it controls this cluster from the Helm client. So what we have here is another layer of control on top of normal Kubernetes control, which actually uses Kubernetes control to um, do what Helm client actually wants. And, and we spoke with, uh, with Archie the other day that that might be the less uh, or the more controversial part of, um, of Helm, especially considering the, the, the plugins that you can install in kubectl itself. So instead of creating a tool that will control the kube control, maybe other option would be creating a plugin that will extend the normal kube control commands with Helm commands. That will actually make sense, at least to who we, who we spoke about. But that's not the case, at least not at the moment. Not at the moment we have this tiller that runs inside 
Kubernetes cluster and actually controls the cluster from within. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, two parts. The Helm client, um, you use the client to um, pack your um, services uh, into a Helm chart. So um, it will create the star GZ with all the templates and all the values and everything. Um, you manage the repositories on the client. You say, I want to work with that repository or with another repository. You control it uh, on the client as well. And of course, interacting with the server itself. Now the server part does um, gets the command from, from the client, uh, combining the chart and the configuration to create a release, right? which means like a fully populated uh, descriptor files. And then it installs the chart into Kubernetes, tracks them, um, does upgrades, does um, rollbacks, uh, deletions, etc., etc. Upgrading and uninstalling charts again by interacting with Kubernetes itself. So far, so good. Awesome. Okay, just a short list of the most critical, important commands and what they are doing. So Helm in it initializes the tiller inside your Kubernetes client uh, uh, cluster. So you run that and it installs itself and takes control over your Kubernetes command. Helm search, you search for packages. You say, I want to find packages that will install our factory. And this is how it works. Helm install downloads those packages from the repository and passes them to the teller. Teller will pre-populate the templates and will actually run everything in Kubernetes. Helm status gives you the status of what's going on with your uh, different uh, charts. Uh, and Helm repo is actually a bunch of commands for working with repositories. Removing repositories, adding new repositories, um, creating repository index, etc. Et so once we start, start talking about repositories, what Helm repository is, there is an official central repository which is called kubernetesapps.com. Um, it's a service provided by Bitnami, who are um, very big contributors in Kubernetes um, ecosystem in general and in Hel uh, Helm in particular. So they manage this repository. And um, what you see here is a subset of what you see inside Helm GitHub repository. So in GitHub repository uh, of Helm, you'll see about 600 um, charts. Some of them are incubating and some of them are released. What you see here are only the released ones. That's why the number is, is, is not so big. But, you know, the important ones are already here, so we're all good. Um, yeah. Uh, that's the official repository, but you really need to get your local repository. That's true for any other dependency manager. It's also true for Kubernetes. And that's for two main reasons. First, you want to cache and proxy kubernetesapps.com, just because you never know what's going on. They will be here tomorrow, not will be here tomorrow. Unpublished gate, talking about why NPM sucks, etc., etc. Um, you should have your local proxy. The other reason for having your local proxy is you want to create charts for your own deployments. And you need a place to put them because you want to share them within the organization, you want to share them with your team members, so you need a central repository to put your, your own charts, which are not public and shouldn't go to GitHub or, or, or wherever. So you need a local one. Now, Creating a Helm repository is a piece of cake. No sarcasm intended at all. All you need to do is run an HTTP server with index.yaml. Index.yaml, as I mentioned, lists all the charts which are available under this HTTP address. And this is all. Now, more so, Helm repo index will generate this index.yaml for you. So basically, all you need is like three lines of JavaScript code that will expose a directory to um, HTTP commands. And every time something new is deployed, run recalculate repo index and replace the file. It is really, really simple. It probably won't have authentication. It won't have um, HA. 
it won't proxy the official Kubernetes apps.com. Um, it won't have any user management. It won't support anything else than Helm, but it is will it will be the minimum valuable Helm wrapper that you can think of. Obviously, it's not the best. The other option is actually taking the best, right? Um, yeah. So the other option is using Artifactory for um, as a Helm um, as a Helm repository. And the benefits on top of all the additional functionality that I mentioned is that um, Artifactory is a universal artifact repository. It not only supports Helm, it supports tons of other stuff, including Docker um, that you need for your Kubernetes uh, um, containers and everything else inside your containers. And that, of course, includes NPM, uh, Ruby, Python, uh, Java, um, PHP, God forbid, uh, wh whatever you work with, it's probably there. .NET, by the way, also on the, yeah. Um, everything, everything that you work with is already there. And this is super important, and I will take a couple of minutes to explain why it's so important to have one tool for that. Obviously, Artifactory, that would be my suggestion, but any other universal repository that supports more than one technology gives, gets you closer to the place you want to be, and I will explain. So, um, yeah, we live in what we call the age of binaries. Um, starting uh, around 2001, uh, way before um, where dinosaurs uh, live or something, um, trends that emerged in there, each and every one of them, bring more and more artifacts, binary files to our lives. It started with Agile and continuous integration. Continuous integration means every commit we do now, we build binaries for it. And that's the opposite of waterfall when we build those binaries every six months. Now we do it for every commit, right? And then we have continuous delivery and continuous deployment, which basically means not only we build those binaries, we shouldn't throw them away because they start to go through this pipeline and might very well end up as our product. So we need to keep track of them. And then uh, DevOps, um, which means not only now we have application files, binaries, but also on the ops side of the house, we now have uh, virtual machine images and configuration um, um, infrastructure as code uh, artifacts like um, chef cookbooks and puppet modules and all those are artifacts that we need to track as well. And then microservices basically say the more artifacts you have, the better. Right? That's like microservices in one line. That's, that's the essence. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, Docker. And here all bets are off. Every line you change in your Docker build will generate tons of weird files with SHA-2 as their name and their layers. Some of them are orphan, will never get garbage collected. The other are reference and you have no idea what's going on. A lot of binaries. And this is just the start because next we have all that in our light bulbs. In each and every one of them, we will run Docker images, which might be composed of several layers, and some of them are related to each other and all that, in a light bulb. So, yeah, um, a lot of binaries. And you know what? We start to realize that binaries are at least as important as the source files, if not more so. So here, this is your normal pipeline. This is something that most of you now do every day. Sure, you start with your source code, you write your code, but right after it gets to the CI server, all you care about are binary files. All the promotion through quality gates, which is the essence of any pipeline, is actually moving binary files from one repository to another and deploying them to different environments from those repositories all the way to production. And that means that you deal with files that eventually will become your product, your customer-facing product, and this is why they are important. Just to give you the big picture of what I'm talking about, here is a diagram that sums it up. Um, every, everything starts with engineers, not necessarily developers, but any type of software engineers who are writing code. And that will be developers who will write their application, but they also 
will use um, stuff like Docker and, and Kubernetes, obviously, and Helm, and will write different types of descriptors, which are all considered source code that use dependency managers. And I'm back to my favorite topic of the night, right? Dependency managers of all types. And you can see here, there are some Java ones like Maven and Gradle. There are some Ruby gems and, and, and uh, NuGet and um, the PHP Composer, of course. And then we have the Helms and the Dockers and the RPMs and Debians of the op side of the house. All of them are the same. We are writing source code and we use dependency managers in them. And now if you wonder, okay, how many dependency managers are using every day? Let's consider a Docker file. First line is using a dependency manager, obviously Docker to resolve a base image from a Docker registry. Second and third lines are obviously dependency manager. They use um, apt-get uh, Debian package manager to get dependencies. Third line is obviously a Java dependency manager in which you need to fight in order to make it to do what you actually want. And this one is a dependency manager as well. And it's as good as any else because it goes to the internet and downloads stuff from the internet, the essence of dependency managers. This one is probably not a dependency manager, but I'm not quite sure anymore. This one is for sure because it takes the file from somewhere outside and brings it inside as a dependency. That's a dependency manager. And here, I have no idea what this application is doing. With all that in mind, it's probably a dependency manager as well. Right, so they are everywhere. Everything you do is about those guys those days, right? So eventually, you use all them correctly, and now they should go and bring those dependencies. Right, each and every one of them is pre-configured with some central repository or registry that it will try to hit. And if you are smart enough, you will forbid them from doing so, instead sending them all to your own a universal artifact repository, artifactory or not, whatever you are using, but it will be something in-house because you need this control. Now, if, the, if they try to bring new dependencies which do not exist, your repository register or whatever you are using will go to the outside world, to those central repositories, and will bring all the new dependencies, cache them inside, and then serve them back to the tools that ask them. Eventually, after a lot of trial and error, your build will eventually be successful. And then, next step is CI server kicking in. CI server checks out the changes and does the exactly same build that we saw earlier here. With exactly the same tools, with exactly the same dependency managers, it will build exactly the same build and Eventually, again, after all the needed integration, that's why it's continuous integration server, it will be successful. But before that, those tools need those dependencies because they are cached on your developer machine. Next, they need to be cached inside your, or used inside your CI server. So your CI server will in turn go to your repository and get all the, all, all, all the same dependencies from there. Now, this time it will work for sure because they are already being pre-cached right here. So the build will be successful and the artifacts will be created. And here is where the story of metadata about artifacts begins. CI server is a unique source of truth for a lot of unique metadata about your artifacts. It knows how they were built which dependencies were used, for example, which environment variables were used, who built them, how long it take, who was the author, etc., etc. Now, CI servers, we trend to, um, we trend to um, treat them as ephemeral. No, uh, that's a hard word. Ephemeral. Ah, I was close, right? Which means we can kill them at any time we want and spin off a new ones. They are practically stateless because all they do is checking out the source code, build the artifacts, and deploy them. 
which is true, but if they are those temporary creatures that we can kill at any time, the information about the creation of artifacts will be lost forever each time we kill them and create the new ones. So this information has to be captured and stored with the artifacts in your repository because this information is critical for the following steps of our pipeline that we are going to talk about. So once we capture those and the artifacts are in your artifact repository, it's time to ask different questions about those artifacts. For example, are they safe? Are there any vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities? Are there any problems with licenses that we want to know? Maybe we have a viral open source license that someone wanted to use. Or maybe we have a license which we are not allowed to use for our um, organizational reasons. Right? Maybe we are Oracle and we don't want to use uh, components that were developed by our competitors. So we won't allow that, for example. We have, again, JFrog have a solution for that. We have what is called JFrog X-Ray. I'm going to show you a little bit about that. But it, again, it doesn't matter. Whatever you can learn about the artifacts that you just created, that will be a good time. And now you start with the pipeline. So you have all the quality assurance tools that run one after another, checking your artifacts. They might rule your artifacts as, OK, we should stop here and not continue anymore. And then we kind of, OK, the, the pipeline stop. Or they can just contribute additional metadata. So for example, let's say we have an artifact that um, the, the Selenium UI testing tool discovered that it works as expected in uh, Chrome and Firefox, but doesn't work well in Safari. That's a good option. Another one. We don't mock Internet Explorer anymore, right? It's not fun. Um, Opera. It doesn't work well in Opera. Opera, especially Opera Mini. Classic. Vivaldi. Whatever. I know too much browsers. Yeah. Too many browsers in my head. Uh, right. So um, this information might be used for a decision. Not necessarily test failed, we throw them away. Maybe we want to use this artifact anyhow because who uses Opera Mini anyhow? Right? And, and then, after we make those decisions, based on all the metadata that we gather, how it was created, what were the dependencies, did we have any problems with vulnerabilities and licenses, do we have any issues with security, afterwards, we make the decision of going to production by deploying the deployable software using Kubernetes or other tools, or rolling them out for distribution for software, for, for clients which will download our software. Right, so people don't download software anymore. We only download browser and then that's all. That's the only software we download. But light bulbs download software. So this area of distributable software is kind of reborn with IoT and became very, very important. And this metadata that we gathered is critical for the light bulb to decide whether it should download an update or not. Gee, that's a weird word we're living in. So, um, does it make sense? Again, the tools here are, of course, this is why they pay me for, but the idea of the importance of metadata is that this is what I want you to, um, uh, to take away with. And uh, I will show you a little bit of, um, of stuff again that how it actually looks like. And again, I will show JFrog stack for, a, for, for an example, but you can, you can take it to whatever, um, whatever direction you want. You can actually try and implement it yourself. There is no technically impossible or top secret patented stuff that I'm going to show you. So what I want to show you is, is one of the usages of the metadata that we spoke about. And, and what I want to show you is start with kind of backwards, starting with, with, with the deployed application. So uh, here I have a, a Helm application that was successfully installed in my, um, in my cluster. And uh, I will show you the console output and how it actually works. Is it big enough? It's weird enough. Why? Right? Okay. This, is, this is weird. Ah, OK, I know why. 
uh, mirror displays. That will fix it. Ah, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, is it big enough for everybody to see in the back? A little bit bigger. Let's do it a little bit bigger. Okay, here we go. Right, so we start, we run some stuff here, and uh, what we do is Helm init, and Helm init, as I mentioned, initializes the tiller inside my Kubernetes cluster, and then it adds um, two uh, repositories. One is the public, uh, the public repository, the Kubernetes apps, and the other is a, a local repository which runs on this machine. Those are the two default repositories that Helm comes with, right? And then the init is done, and happy helming means, means we are ready, and then we actually start to do our stuff. First, we add Artifactory as another Helm repository because our Helm chart actually comes from there. And this was added to our repositories, and then we update the local um, knowledge about existing charts from our newly added repository, update complete, and now we do upgrade of our application. So we run an upgrade of our existing application, and we actually have it now deployed, right? So this is like, the, the, this is the Kubernetes services status, this is what we have, and this is our Helm status, what it actually has. So I have here a cluster IP that this is public, right? No. External IP, it's not here. Where it is, not ready assigned. So I can take it from the live thing. That We don't know that. Um, so that's my Docker app chart. Uh, I have two of them. I think that will be this one. And the port is 881. Oh, okay, this is amazing application, and that's, um, if you are now amazed by my UI and front-end skills, I have to say that's not me, that's Jainish. If I would do it, it would be without the image, because I have no idea how to do that. Well, and you can say, you know what, Baruch, we could expect that from you, but Jainish, he probably used other fonts, and the CSS got screwed up somehow. So let's figure out what was it. We want to track it back to the source and see what, what, are, we, what are we looking for? What actually the sources of all this, all this beauty? And for that, we can go to Artifactory and actually search for, this, um, search for this Helm chart to look what we have inside, right? So we can, we can go here and you, we can use search or just browse by artifacts, Let's browse for fun. We can filter and say, I want a Helm only, and that will be Helm, and those are my Helm repositories. It will be inside Helm local, Docker app chart. That's the, that's the guy. Okay, so we can see all that, but the interesting part here is this build stop. This build stop is the metadata that I mentioned earlier, this build of materials. That was captured in Jenkins when this chart was created. And I can say, okay, somehow I build it twice, it generated the same file, so it refers from two different builds. Let's go to 21, and this is my Helm chart, and I can see here that I'm not logged in. That's the first thing that we see. And uh, now we see that, it's, that we need to go all the way again and do that. Um, Okay, ah, now I have more stuff. So, this the build, that's the 21, and now I can see it was created in Jenkins by our command line client and whatever. The published modules here, interestingly, have a reference to a Docker image. This is a Docker image that was used inside my Helm chart. So, when we, uh, when we run this Helm upgrade, we actually installed and run this image. So we can look at that and see like, okay, that's my, um, that's my, Docker, that's my Docker file and, and that's my Docker image. Um, and again, here I will see how this image was created. And that's again 
a build inside Jenkins. So I can go from here to Jenkins if I have it around. And as I mentioned, we might not have it around. And see the results, see the console output, and uh, actually see what's going on. So we can see here, I guess we will see download of some files which will go inside this Docker image. And we will probably want to track those as well. And then we actually see uh, somewhere here Docker build. Right, ah, this is it. Docker, here we go. Right, Docker build. So it created this Docker image, eventually deployed it to Artifactory, and this is what we ended up with. Now let's see what it generated. So it generated obviously a bunch of stupidly named layers, which don't make a lot of sense. It used a bunch of more stupidly named layers that don't make a lot of sense as well. Now, this was a little bit better because I can see by the repository what it means. So Docker Framework is my base image that I use. So that's, that's not bad. But the interesting part is right here. I have another module that actually refers to what's inside my Docker image. So now I'm getting closer to the, to the code, to the actual code that you rendering of it you saw in your screen. So you can dive into this WAR file. Well, it's Java that explains why it looks suboptimal. Um, and, and here you can see, again, tons of stuff about the Java image, but it's about the Java file, but you can also see the build. So here again, Welcome to a Gradle application, Gradle modules. This is our WAR file. And you go like, well, that doesn't say a whole of a lot to me. So is it good? Is it not good? What happened comparing to the previous one, which looked amazing on my screen? It was like applets was running on a screen. It was animated GIFs and it was crazy. And now it's like stupid and I don't see anything. Well, we can compare. We can ask what actually happened. And we can say, I want to understand what's the difference between 8 and um, eight and 14, and, and 7. And then it will tell me, well, look, a bunch of new artifacts were created. OK, it's a new build. They should create new artifacts. But also, some dependencies have changed. Ah, that might be a reason. Maybe that's why. Or you say, you know what? Those are all internal, so nothing actually changed. How about variables? Did environment variables ch change? Maybe I now build it with a wrong version of Java because it was somehow got up to updated in Jenkins and now it produces different results. Well, let's see. We can go to the environment variables and say, well, I want to know which Java version it actually used. And uh, well, it used 1.8. Maybe it explains something, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I want to see the source code to understand what went wrong. And that, of course, I can, I can do from Jenkins again. So I can go here and see, OK, that's the revision, and that's the revision in my Git. So I can go there and see exactly which revision of the Java code run inside the Helm install that I that just run with four different steps in the way between connecting the two dots. So this is the importance of metadata that I've been talking about, and this is why you should record all that. And now, just before we are done, and uh, Archie is not here, I can go for another hour. Because he usually, in this, in this point of time, he does like very scary faces to me. Like, and then I understand I only have an hour ago to go. Um, so yeah, just to finish it up with a different type of metadata that I already mentioned. So let's say all your tests were fine and everything was good, but you used threads too. Anyone remembers Equifax? 145 and a half million of credit records of Americans got stolen uh, in July, half, um, half a year ago, and I'm one of them. And that was because of Strats2. So yeah, Strats2 is a notoriously known super, uh, like, insecure Java web framework. And you can expect from a government-related agency to use, oh, no, I'm in the wrong building to say that. So I strike my last sentence. Um, anyhow, let's just look at X-Ray instead before I run into more troubles. Um, yeah, so X-Ray is a software composition analysis tool. 
Software composition analysis tool means it analyzes the software recursively to find whatever metadata you care about. So it comes out of the box with database of security vulnerabilities. It got updated from national vulnerability database and a bunch of other sources. And then everything you throw on it, regardless of what it is, Docker image, WAR file, zip file, um, NPM package, or, or, or RPM package, it will go and analyze whatever it can find. So here, and again, that's too small. So here you can see that our beloved Strats vulnerability was found inside a proprietary WAR file that, of course, system had no idea what it is before, which it was a part of a Docker layer, which was a part of a Docker image, which was a part of the build. So we recursively analyzes them, and then in this Docker image, we found, I don't remember how many it was, um, 128 issues on, on all the layers. Uh, we probably also used Ubuntu that has hard bleed for the fun of it, right? And, but, but you got the gist. We, we can find all of them recursively. And we can do the other way around. So we can do and say, okay, I want to, now I heard about, now all you heard about Strats too. And the first thing you do tomorrow morning is, guys, we need to find if we, find, if, if we use Strats too. We need to find it anywhere inside of our organization. So again, tool like Extra can help with that. Strats to show me where it is. Well, you have Strats to in a bunch of uh, WAR files. Well, that's okay. We don't deploy WAR files. We deploy Docker images. But maybe this WAR is a part of a Docker layer. Oh, it's a part of a Docker layer. Yeah, but Baruch told me most of the Docker layers are not in use and garbage and should be garbage collected. Well, let's see. Uh, this layer is a part of a Docker image. Okay, but maybe this Docker image wasn't ever deployed. Let's take a look. We can take a closer look on the Docker image and see that it is critical. It has tons of different vulnerabilities, actually six pages of vulnerabilities. Uh, good luck with that. And it is actually in your Docker prod registry, which probably means it is in production somewhere and all your information was already stolen. Yes. Now let's do a happy ending to all this nightmare, and I will show you a nice picture. It will be a great picture of Napa Valley in May. What can be better than Napa Valley in May? Um, not a lot of things, but this is Napa Valley in May, and I wanted to invite you to our uh, to Jeffrog user conference when, by the way, Kelsey Hightower that we got mentioned will uh, do a keynote, and Chris, that I have no chance to pronounce his last name, but he is the CEO of CNCF, uh, is going to give a keynote as well. And you can share the stage with those two gentlemen by um, applying to a call for paper, which, run, which uh, runs another week. And uh, the good news about getting accepted to the call for paper you actually get to the conference for free. Napa, Meritage Resorts, tons of wine, good stuff. Do that. Q uh, Q a time before uh, we get to that, just a reminder. Uh, Jeffrey.com uh, slash show notes has the slides by now. The video, if the light is still green. Yes, so you will get the video. And all the links and ratings and comments and um, even a, a raffle for a prize, all this is here. And now if you have any questions, that will be a good time. And if you don't, I completely understand. It was half an hour as I promised. Yes.